welcome everybody. Happy New Year. Happy 2021. Here's hoping that this is better than last year. Uh, my name is Mark Boulay. I'm a data scientist with Sonovus Energy and on behalf of Tim Chan at Suncor, we'd like to thank you for coming by today and spending your time with us have, uh, with uh, this great Melendez topic that we we'll speak about forward. his data experiences and uh, he's a chemical engineer and data scientist. So thanks, Mark. Um, can, I, can everybody hear me? Sounds great. Yep. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah. So I was just going to uh, give you a little bit of a of background into how I got uh, into data and where I came from. I'm sure a lot of people have been in transitions. Mine has been a very interesting transition. Um, I guess my whole experience with data started back when um, I had gotten my chemical engineering, my bachelor's in chemical engineering. So I got my bachelor's in chemical engineering and then I went on to graduate degrees. Um, and I guess during my graduate studies, that's essentially when I started looking into data. Um, throughout my studies, uh, I carried out several projects where I needed uh, large quantities of data to be able to uh, carry out the projects. Now, in some cases, some of the data was available. Um, some of it was not polished enough for what I needed. Uh, a lot of it was missing. So I needed to find ways of uh, creating the, or yeah, essentially creating the data that, that I needed that, that was missing. Um, so yeah, so essentially that's originally how I got into uh, simulation models. And that's where I started. I created simulation models, simple simulation models where I could actually generate large quantities of data that I needed in order to feed that data to what I was actually working on, which were optimization models to solve large, complex industrial problems. Um, these large, complex industrial problems, of course, reflected uh, real world problems that certain companies uh, were having in that in, in, in way, way back when it was, I was working in the forestry and agriculture sectors. So I was looking at uh, supply chains and how to maximize profits while reducing costs, that type of thing. So uh, that's essentially my first dip into the pool of uh, data and the whole data science. Um, forward several years later, uh, I finished my graduate studies uh, went to look for a job and a company here in Calgary um, was interested in me. They wanted me to essentially continue working in simulation and optimization, but for the oil and gas industry. So yeah, I basically picked up at that point in time, I was living in Montreal, moved over to Calgary and started working in the oil and gas industry. Um, thankfully, because of my uh, background in chemical engineering, uh, it was, I, I won't say easy, but at least it was easier for me to uh, wrap my brain around the different concepts involved in oil and gas uh, than it was uh, for others. So yeah, so I, sp I spent the better part of uh, four and a half, almost five years working with that company. Um, doing several things. So initially I started working with simulation and optimization models, building prototypes for the oil and gas industry. Uh, we would then take those prototypes, uh, work with clients to see what they thought of them, um, try and figure out what, how they wanted to interact, if the results were positive, what type of data they could give us, uh, how the data was being fed to us. And eventually that essentially created a loop where we would uh, crew make modifications to the prototypes, go back to the clients, they would work with it for a while, and then they would come back with recommendations and we would work in that loop over and over again until both parties were satisfied with, with the result. Once we reached that, uh, that point, then we would start the process of moving those prototype models into a cloud platform uh, where the clients could access them from any part, from any point in the world, and we could maintain them on a commercial level. Um, that was a whole other uh, part of the process that at that point, I, at that point in time, I wasn't familiar with. Um, thankfully, we had a lot of uh, a lot of good people working with us in the in the company. Um, a lot of uh, developers, a lot of architects, a lot of uh, a couple of data scientists. And they basically 
helped uh, with the process. They taught me a lot of, uh, along the way. Um, it was interesting because I had to wear multiple hats. So in a big way, my part in developing the prototypes was over. Um, I had to transition more into a developer role where I was starting to work with uh, the actual models, looking at the results and trying to figure out how to improve the results, getting the models to work faster, um, getting the models to work on a on a cloud base on a cloud platform that maybe originally it wasn't designed to work on, and making sure that everything was working the way it was in the prototype. So um, at that point in time, of course, I started to learn a lot about development. Um, I started to code quite a bit, um, and from there, it's just. It was just a matter of, um, at that point in time, data science was starting to pick up and it was a almost a, a seamless transition for me as the next step in my career to start moving into data science. So I knew optimization, I knew simulation, I knew a little bit about, I knew a little bit about development um, and just basically started to uh, look into data science. I knew it was something I was interested in I knew it was something that I wanted to, to learn more about. So after work every day, you know, you go online, you take courses and you start learning about all the different uh, technologies and software programs and uh, algorithms that you need to learn about. And uh, that's basically carried me to the point where I am right now, where I'm way on, well, I'm well on my way to becoming a full fledged data scientist. Um, I've still got a couple of a uh, couple of courses that I need to take, and uh, but yeah, hopefully that's essentially where I where I hope to end up. Um, I find as our relationship continues to grow, uh, I'm getting to to uh, work with a lot of you on on a more intimate basis, which has been fantastic. Uh, before I get into my presentation, we I want to quickly touch on. Uh, the results that we've been seeing from the testing that we've been doing. Um, and I got to say, it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've seen some really positive results. And I'm curious to see where it all ends up. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of have to keep our ear to the ground here and uh, uh, keep it going. But I just wanted to share that it's been very, very positive, And I think uh, it's only going to get better. Um, so I hope that uh, we continue to add this value uh, as we move forward together. Awesome. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Go. Last time I went my whole presentation without sharing it. Um, can you guys see that all right? Absolutely. So not tonight, Kellen. You're doing awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm on the boat. Last time I literally went through the entire thing. So. I'll try to be a little bit better this time. Um, so it's pretty much the same that we've been seeing. Uh, one thing that I noticed about my other presentations is everything I've said has been anecdotal, uh, which is you know me telling you guys what I've been seeing, which is the wrong approach for uh, a group of data scientists or aspiring data scientists or you know um, data you know data enthusiasts. Um, so I thought this time around, I would actually bring some numbers to my presentation. Um, the good news is I wasn't lying to you folks. It's been, it has been what I've said it's been uh, for the most part. And the biggest things that we have noticed, now this is referring to Q4 of 2020, um, is the, the rise in development roles. Uh, we have seen uh, obviously across Canada, 7.61 increase. This is just what we have seen as an organization. Um, we work with hundreds of clients. Our base is ma mainly out of Vancouver, but we are uh, growing here in Calgary and in Toronto as well. Uh, and as you can see, Crown Corporations are up, finance, insurance, uh, natural, uh, natural resources and energy is actually up as well, as well as transportation. Um, the biggest things to point, though, are the PMO roles are decreasing and have been decreasing across the board from what we saw even in late 2019. Uh, so it does hold true that uh, development roles are, are king right now in the market as far as what we've been seeing. 
a lot of that um, new JavaScript technologies. As far as Alberta goes, um, it holds just as true. Uh, we've seen the most development roles for our size compared to the other sizes of the offices. We have seen the most development roles, about 80% um, up to today, about 80% of what we've been seeing has been in software development, uh, full stack, front end, UX, UI. The point being, it's all been user centered products. So products around, you know, being used by the end users. So SaaS clients um, and where we're seeing it with government is on legacy application replacements. So they're getting rid of the COBOL and uh, ASP.NET MVC and coming in with the Node.js. We're seeing a ton of Node.js, PHP, Laravel, um, those types of development projects that th those have been really what we've been seeing the most of. <clears throat> Particular to uh, the Alberta market, but more so the Calgary market, um, we were seeing the energy sector has adjusted in, in Q4. Uh, they're obviously focusing on cutting costs and levering, re leveraging technology. So a lot of the automation and data science is actually going into the energy sector, which is fantastic to see and exactly what we've been looking at. Uh, as far as the user-centered product development, I touched on this a little bit. We're seeing a ton of work in UX, UI, React development, Node.js, um, mainly on digital projects, whether they be digital innovation or full-blown legacy application replacements. Uh, another huge thing that we're seeing, which is absolutely fantastic, I personally love it because I've been working from home. Um, I know some people don't enjoy it as much as I do, but uh, the opportunity to wor work remotely is um, definitely becoming more and more prevalent with these software companies. They're starting to recognize that there is a shortage in Calgary, so they are looking outward. Uh, we're, we're getting candidates positions in Nova Scotia, uh, really anywhere across Canada, it doesn't matter. Uh, at this point, someone like myself is recruiting in Toronto and really anywhere, anywhere, anywhere in Canada that, uh, that people are looking. That's how high the demand is. And then um, even more so in Alberta, there has been a real shortage and huge drop off in major PMO initiatives. Uh, and this is obviously due to COVID, but there's probably some other reasons there as well. Uh, you're starting to see more, um, how do I say this, quasi technical roles where you have, uh, instead of a business analyst, you have a business systems analyst who comes from a development background working on these projects. So the days of dedicated project managers and business analysts, we're hoping they come back, but it's been limited. Um, so I don't know if anybody had any questions on that. I suppose I'll save that to the end. Um, that was essentially the, the Q4 update and it really was everything that we've spoken about for the last probably two or three meetups now. Um, I wanted to touch back on the assessments here. Uh, I think that we are seeing some really positive results. So I'd like to keep it going. Now, um, just to be upfront and, and transparent, it's, uh, we have been getting busier. So it's been a little bit harder for me to get back to you folks um, in a very timely manner. So I do apologize. It's not my intention to uh, you know, to delay responses. Uh, but I do want to keep this thing going. So um, as always, if you're interested, please send me an email on the assessment that you're looking to do. I have extended out the library to uh, many, many people that are actually here today um, to be beyond the data, the world of, of data science. So, you know, before it was just Python R data science. Now I'm looking at it and we have data management, we have data analytics, we have SQL administration as well as programming. Uh, we have an entire library uh, at your disposal. 
So uh, I highly recommend that you guys utilize that. I don't know that we're going to be able to do it forever, but uh, certainly this time around, let's keep it going. And um, I hope that next time I can also uh, have some positive results to share with you guys again, because it has been great so far. So now we get to hear another data story from a data scientist that's based in Calgary. Thomas C. is a data scientist in the Enbridge Technology and Innovation Lab, currently responsible for leading the development of an advanced analytics solution that uses technologies including data science, simulation, and cloud computing. He's a valued member of the Untapped Energy community as he believes that data is the new oil. Wait, no that data is the new energy, and he's quite passionate about how technology and innovation can be applied to transform the energy industry into a new energy future. And so prior to joining Enbridge, Thomas led and developed predictive and data analytic solutions for various energy and telecom organizations. He holds a master's of science degree in chemical engineering process control from the University of Alberta. So welcome, Thomas. Thanks, team. Yeah, uh, my name is Thomas, and thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure to meet uh, each one of you uh, through this uh, virtual way, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I guess what we just heard about you is really just the two-dimensional view of who you are, uh, you know, what one might typically find on a LinkedIn profile. And normally that type of intro works uh, for a presenter who's about to jump into a 30 to 45 minute lecture style presentation. But Thomas, we're going to do things a little bit different tonight. Uh, we'd like to get to know you and your thoughts with more dimension and depth. And so while we do this conversation style, uh, anyone who in the audience who would like to jump in and ask a question can do so through our monitor chat window and Mark will relay those questions to us. So I thought to just get things going, we're going to start with something called this or that or another. So I'm going to read two words to you and you get to choose one of those or another. Okay, so let's see how this works. Okay. Let's start with this. Chocolate or vanilla? Uh, vanilla, yeah. Okay, Okay. now we read in your bio that you, you do uh, play basketball in your pastime. LeBron or Giannis? Uh, this one is pretty sure for me, definitely LeBron. Mm -hmm. Okay, old school. <laughs> Next one, uh, Netflix or YouTube? Um, I think I'm more leaning to YouTube because uh, I see there are a bunch of uh, different types of uh, uh, videos, contents from YouTube. For example, there are like something related to tutorials. I often go to like tutorial on YouTube and uh, it's pretty straightforward and pretty handy. Okay. Okay. We're going to get a little bit more technical now. Okay. Uh, Python or R? Um... I would like to say Python, but I do use these uh, actually before. And uh, I actually started with R and um, uh, get used to that. And uh, But later just transformed to, to Python. Uh, I think uh, Python is like relatively easier for me to, to, to deal with. And uh, it's more straightforward. And well, R is more like, uh, uh, you know, it's the uh, uh, vector vectorized the language, pretty similar to MATLAB. Um, I would definitely go with Python. Okay. And remember, the name of this game is this or that or another. So feel free if uh, none of the ones that I've read is uh, what you would choose, you can also throw in another one. Okay, okay. so for this next one, uh, Tableau or Spotfire? Um, I think this is uh, pretty deterministic for me as well, because I only used Tableau before. Uh, Spotify is very famous and used in uh, a variety of uh, enterprises. Uh, but I think Tableau, it's so far as the, I would like to rate this the kind of number one uh, BI tool for me. Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. And how about this as a last one? Logistic or Ridge? Um, so Tim, if I kind of like interpret this correctly, you mean probably uh, one logistic is the uh, logistic regression and uh, ridge and with the, the ridge, right? Um, I would like to go with ridge because uh, from a general uh, generalization perspective, it's uh, it maybe probably a logistic can give a very good uh, 
model, but may, may not have like a proper generalization capability on, on new data. Well, rich through regularization, through some kind of like panel, uh, the, the panel, uh, uh, actually, uh, penalizing the some of the the parameters can give you a, a easy to interpret, easy to understand model. I would like to go with Rich. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for that. So, Thomas, you. uh, you're you're currently a data scientist with the Enbridge Technology and Innovation Lab. Can you tell us a little bit about what this lab is, and then what does it look like to work in a lab in the energy industry? Um, yeah, so actually, maybe probably um, I can just uh, um, start with uh, uh, how the, the lab is, looks like. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you again, Tim, for having me today for this meet meetup. And uh, thank all, all the other co-hosts for, uh, for tonight. And uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, share with you a little bit about my background and journey. So let me just start with lab. So when we talk about lab, it just remind me of the days uh, in, in, in the undergrad university. So, you know, conducting a, a bunch of experiments and which can most likely lead to some innovation or some surprise. Um, and uh, experiments allows failure to happen. Uh, but summarizing good or not can help us proceed more smoothly in future. So now you may see the point where I bridge from a traditional research institutional lab to the lab uh, that right uh, right now I'm in, so which is Enbridge Technology Innovation Lab. Um, so a little bit more, a little bit more about this lab. Did it back to the beginning of uh, 2019, uh, where, where it's just still uh, pandemic free, and but AI is on its way to continuously soar. Uh, some em Enbridge leaders see the visions of how AI can boost the, the business and the operations in mainstream sector. Uh, that is the time when Technology Innovation Lab came to be in Calgary as an experimental open man for uh, fast failure, working with uh, agile men side and design thinking to build an open IT style technology center within Enbridge. Um, so with a bunch of ongoing products um, and also working with a group of different roles such as product owners, scrum masters, business analysts, software developers, data specialists, um, the time is the fast pacing in, in sprints and to build values for business uh, by practicing some of the principles such as agile and design thinking. Yeah, and I know you were saying that, oh, um, well, history a long time ago was 2019 pre-COVID. Um, so this is um, very uh, recent, um, but yet very uh, leading. Um, so this really then enables a company like Enbridge to be able to then um, innovate to, as you mentioned, fail fast and get to the point where now you can scale up some of these innovations. So um, as far as you know, what are some examples of artificial intelligence and digitization technology um, that you see currently applied in the oil and gas industry that came that birthed out of some of this um, innovative um, effort? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, specifically, um... As you know, uh, Enbridge is not only a pipeline company, but uh, but also its business is pretty uh, diverse. So, um, you know, Enbridge has a footprint uh, in green energy as well, um, including 18 onshore and offshore wind farms in North America and Europe uh, with more than 3,400 uh, megawatts of gross capacity with projects in operation or under construction. Uh, maintenance cost of the wind assets is the largest cost for wind power operations. So within Enbridge, in the lab, uh, we take uh, predictive models, predictive analytics, and use them to identify wind turbine blade defects, um, time to failure estimation, and also use predictive models to estimate the remaining uh, lifetime giving the turbine blade. So consequently, this has um, unlocked around 50% of projected annual savings on inspection costs. It also reduced uh, blade inspection process time from three months to three weeks. So as you see that uh, the, the introduction of AI can reduce the cost and boost productivity and safety. Um, another quick example is the, um, um, the digital twin concept. Uh, in Enbridge pipeline network. 
through a technology partnership with Microsoft. And uh, they used to be called uh, Fingerfoot Advanced Technology Group, now called Unity. Um, so in that uh, example, uh, the collected data are visualized through the uh, augmented reality, mixture reality, which is AR, MR settings. Um, 3D rendering of pipeline uh, sections were realized. Uh, through, through this project, users can identify hazards uh, in, the, in the pipe very easily, which saves huge efforts for uh, pipeline integrity engineers who used to work with a lot of Microsoft uh, Excel files, Excel spreadsheets. And data as assets have been uh, fully utilized to provide users an exper experience through, uh, for example, rotating, zooming, and expanding on virtual images of pipelines. And areas of uh, concern along the pipelines are then depicted through using uh, heat map and, and giving users the flexibility to view the uh, various measures, such as um, um, geological forces and see changes as they occur over time. And I, I think it's a, a pretty cool initiative in the Embridge Technology Innovation Lab using these uh, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, digital twin concept, these uh, cutting edge technology. Right. And every, whenever we think of cutting edge technology, there's always this uh, glamour uh, towards it. And, and you can see a lot of companies um, uh, wanting to embrace that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the bottom line. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, boosting the efficiency. Can you tell us a bit more about how some of these applications are boosting the efe efficiency across the entire industry and how um, um, these approaches can better tackle some of the challenges that companies all across the industry are facing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let me just take Alberta ex example. Uh, we are uh, just uh, heavily invested in oil and gas and also famous for oil and gas. Um, so in, Al in Alberta, industry leaders are uh, using these um, AI, uh, ML, um, and uh, cloud computing to modernize their business models through a combination of uh, these uh, advanced analytics, data analytics, and uh, all of these technologies together. And um, as Tim, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, data is the new oil, and it's, it's a very famous saying. And but if the data if the if the data is not um, refined properly, it cannot be really used. And so data must be broken down and analyzed for it to have value. So data as assets have been gradually explored um, through the introduction of enhanced computational power um, and concepts of AI. Um, so for example, uh, we have great amount of data in let's say in a single drilling rig, terabytes of data daily, only recently we can, uh, we, we, we are able to start to create business value on this small fraction. So um, about like how AI can help our industry. Uh, personally, I think there are mainly two points. Uh, the first one is AI can help to optimize the end-to-end -end oil and gas value chain. Uh, in oil and gas, we have uh, a chain from upstream, midstream, and downstream, where multiple plants, processes, and assets are interdependent with each other. Um, and all of the efforts which is trying to get barrel out of the ground more efficiently and cost effectively. And I remember um, there is a business case where one of the largest uh, integrated oil and gas producer collaborating with IBM to improve uh, production optimization uh, within their um, upstream operations facilities to optimize across different silos and flag upsets earlier uh, for timely response and identify actionable op opportunities in, in real time. So over a hundred machine learning models were applied in a system of a system approach and now the solution has been skilled, can predict plant upsets ahead of time in a more accurate way, and also provide the recommendations to the uh, to end users to uh, maximize the production metrics and generate new, uh, for example, new production schedules 
in a few moments through through a user interface so so that users can easily access this information generated from predictive model and then give users feedback so users can get the value from this value chain and um Secondly, about um, how AI can help the industry, especially like for oil and gas, I think um, AI can help uh, make uh, money saving and cost effective decisions uh, every day. So um, as we know, data has been used in the decision process heavily, especially recently. Um, using AI in the, uh, for example, in upstream, it's um, interpreting, analyzing, and modeling the, the data to enhance uh, existing production and also can extend the life of, for example, existing wells or bring older wells back to life. And by augmenting uh, human decision-making through real-time insights coming from AI, driven by AI, um, it has the power to optimize and transform the upstream operations. Um, but after like considering these two points, another thing I want to emphasize a little bit, uh, given the powerfulness of AI, is that um, when dealing with AI, we have a lot of data, and uh, uh, there's never going to be a way to bypass data issue. And so, data quality and building, uh, as well as uh, building explainable models, are still challenging uh, for oil and gas industry. So, especially because as we are a traditional um, industry, we base safety as a top priority. Um, whether the results coming from AI is whether the results are trustable, explainable, uh, or transparent or ethical still requires some efforts to validate until we are we feel uh, comfortable saying that, oh, okay, the results coming from AI, we trust them and uh, it's, uh, it can guarantee the safety when we put them, when we launch them uh, online. So I think that's uh, more about the AI governance piece, uh, which is right now booming and uh, it's another uh, broad area. Mm. And AI governance uh, then implies that, well, the human is still important part of the equation, um, but that also means that then now you're relying on human behavior or the culture in order to foster the environment to make all of the potential of applying AI actually come true. So when we're thinking about the culture, particularly that found in the digital transformation in a very traditional sector like oil and gas, as, as you've indicated, what have you seen that has helped to cultivate an innovative mindset within this culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, especially if, uh, innovative uh, culture, the mindset. It's I think uh, it's the traditional industry like oil and gas needs. Um, I want I just want to use the culture in the Enbridge Technology Innovation Lab as an example because I'm part of that. And um, so currently uh, the the culture in Enbridge Technology Innovation Lab, it's very dynamic and uh, very nimble. Um, we have a bunch of uh, small teams um, scaling fast and building uh, sustainability as part of the, uh, the, the agile mindset. And uh, some proof of concept, in, in, instead of like working on a huge waterfall projects, we work on uh, proof of concept within, let's say a couple of weeks, uh, and demonstrate the values to the leadership. And right now, the the culture uh, per se in the in the lab is driven by the values. So specifically, we have five main values. Um, the first one is we, we are passionate about our purposes. So pur purposes including the work, the solutions, and the continuous development and growth um, for employees, for the team members uh, in careers, and also, we the second one is we treat problems as a great chance to grow by embracing the risks and filling the gaps. And which is we, we know there always be risks, there always be gaps, and uh, there always be like challenges. But uh, in in terms in, instead of like uh, uh, kind of resist uh, 
say say no to these challenges. We we treat them as a big chance and to to embrace them. Um, the third one I, I would like to uh, emphasize is that, that we are proud of our work and uh, uh, believe we are part of the group to make a difference. So uh, this life right now, we, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's different from um, the other department and uh, we're working on different products and um, creating uh, business values, collaborating with uh, our stakeholders and then uh, present what we develop to them. Um, the fourth one I want to emphasize is that uh, in the lab, uh, we were very curious to ex explore cutting edge technology, the technology that I mentioned uh, in the examples, uh, uh, AR, MR, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, uh, computer vision, et cetera. And uh, not af afraid of failure, because uh, we believe that the failure is part of the learning process. So that's why I like, um, adopting this, uh, the agile methodology, we, we can uh, bear uh, some like faster failure and learn from that quickly. Um, the last one I want to emphasize is that uh, um, the whole app uh, is, a, is a family uh, full of talents and uh, each one support each other. So it's like um, all the team members, although we are like uh, allocated into different team, different squads, and, but we maintain a close relationship with each other. And uh, um, so like, for example, when some proof of, uh, some proof of concepts are, are finished or completed, um, the, the resources will be shuffled and then you're gonna have like chances to work with uh, some other team members you never worked before and uh, uh, really cross-functional to each other. Um, so I think to cultivate such innovative culture, uh, which is right now I seeing that I'm, I'm, I'm currently observing um, during uh, COVID, I think especially for the past year that uh, uh, a bunch of oil and gas companies have been adopting. It, it, I think uh, from a culture perspective, I really need the support from first from the upper management leadership, uh, realizing how innovation can benefit the industry. That's number one. Um, the second, it requires the team members with various backgrounds to complement to each other. Um, so the roles that I mentioned uh, previously, they have different backgrounds, different uh, uh, experiences to complement to each other. And uh, last but not the least, I think it requires an innovative way to, uh, to manage the team uh, and the project by practicing uh, some, some principles such as uh, agile and such as the design thinking, uh, something like this. Wow, that's uh, that's wonderful, Thomas. I think when people get to hear that, that um, in an actual setting, that uh, there's a company that has perhaps gotten the culture piece right, it really does enable then some of the benefits of these innovations to materialize. Um, you know, the things that you talked about having uh, all the accessible accessibility to the tools to play with, but yet still having um, that um, liberating freedom to fail and not be punished for it. Um, I think oftentimes we find in the oil and gas industry, one that is so rooted um, in producing as much of a commodity as possible, um, and but also around safety, you don't often get the luxury of having that latitude to try things because sometimes failure does result in something that's quite adverse. Um, so just reflecting on some of the innov innovative outcomes of this lab, um, has Enbridge realized any benefits by implementing AI machine learning type technologies to brownfield assets, um, or is it primarily applied to greenfield assets? Um, I think right now, um, uh, based on my understanding, uh, we do have some like uh, brownfield assets, and uh, we um, let me just take the, the example that I'm currently uh, working on, and uh, so uh, uh, so. Uh, within the lab, we collaborate with, uh, let's say, the, the liquid uh, pipeline department, and uh, they we have existing assets. And uh, but uh, right now, we kind of like not quite sure how we can uh, drive the the maximum uh, capability uh, or to optimize the existing assets 
to make sure that it's running, it's the operation running, you know, uh, in a more optimized way. And uh, these assets right now, they have been like being built, for example, the pipeline system, uh, pipeline network dated back to uh, 1950, 1960s. Uh, they, they have been like pretty uh, uh, running for a long time. And um, um, so giving these assets running for a long time and uh, um, how we can use the uh, the advanced technologies to to actually rejuvenate them and then get them run better. Um, this is the part uh, when I joined the lab and then uh, specifically working on using uh, simulation technology, using the advanced analytics solutions to actually running different scenarios and uh, helping uh, the users to to better understand. Okay, so um, um, and also like using. Um, the, the solutions that we built as something pretty similar to an expert system and just providing them uh, with, uh, with confidence, with the quantifiable results to actually building insights to the system. And uh, also, as you see that right now, we, uh, we are kind of like, uh, we do have some um, investment in the, the Greenfields assets and uh, uh, like, for example, building some new uh, specific, uh, uh, let's say, tanks or in, in a terminal or uh, setting up uh, uh, some uh, new assets within like wind, uh, solar part and uh, wind farms, something like that. And uh, um, uh, these advanced uh, analytic solutions can definitely help with that as well. Um, but I would like to say right now, we are trying to use the new technologies to actually optimize our existing infrastructure and figuring out ways to uh, to focus on the, the Greenfield new project uh, uh, never existing before uh, at the same time. Mm. That's very interesting. Um, the quantification of the benefits realized from taking this approach can sometimes be a little bit tricky when looking at an innovative um, approach. Um, because if you just apply your typical measures of success, be it some sort of return on investment, um, and especially if you're looking at some of these renewable energy sources, um, well, oftentimes the returns using those traditional conventional measures don't really um, pass the threshold. Um, and so this ties to another question that we have received. So through your work, um, it, does Enbridge use a, a different way of measuring um, uh, a successful outcome of uh, such an approach? Um, or, you know, is sometimes the success that you feel just uh, made more of a, a, a factor of an external um, factor or variable? Uh, we work in oil and gas, so uh, our, this industry is very susceptible to the movement of commodity prices. Um, is it because of um, an innovative AI machine learning approach, or were we just lucky and caught the wave of an uprise in commodity prices? Um, that's a that's a very good question. So, uh, based on my understanding, I, I mean, I'll be able to like to tell the whole stories because like uh, midstream is only one part of that, and um, um, I can only uh, share something like related to. Um, to, uh, for example, uh, the, the part, uh, the, the, the projects that uh, uh, I'm currently working on. And uh, from a midstream perspective, um, as, as we know that uh, we kind of like moving the, the liquid inside the system. And um, so um, giving, let's say, uh, a pipeline system, what we are trying to evaluate uh, from metric perspective key metrics are like uh, 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 asset utilization. So means that uh, like how often the assets can be utilized. Um, is there any time that assets staying idle and uh, that we can better leverage it? Um, and also uh, throughput. So throughput means like how much volume had been flow through the um, uh, the system. And um, also we, we measure something like the, the conflict so these are uh, the traditional metrics that we, we from a business perspective, uh, specifically for uh, mainstream sector and uh, with the, with liquid. Um, well, some some of the actually some of the metrics related to AI have been um, introduced into our product, uh, but not necessarily related to the, those that, that I mentioned. 
Um, we have we do have uh, implementation of a com uh, computer vision technologies to to deal with the uh, digitization of our assets, and uh, so it's it's more like feeding the system, feeding uh, AI uh, machine learning algorithms with uh, a bunch of screenshots or snippets of let's say. Um, uh, precise flow diagram and uh, um, the machine learning model, AI AI model can uh, actually recognize. Okay, so here is uh, a segment within uh, within a terminal. Here is a pump. Um, here is a manifold, and uh, the, the the metrics related to uh, uh, these uh, computer vision, machine learning actually. Uh, play a role. It's telling me that okay. So if I want to detect this, I do have like some some bounding boxes, and uh, uh, the the bounding boxes, the the overlap of the bounding boxes, and uh, the um, um, something related to these computer vision parts, and actually actually came into being. So these these metrics are different, are not directly related to business, but they also. Uh, very important to evaluate the performance of these uh, of these solutions that we introduce. And I would like to say it's kind of like a combination. One is directly related to business. The other one is directly to the performance of the um, of the solutions that we introduce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I appreciate that. It, it, it highlights to us that uh, you need to um, look at this holistically. There certainly is a, a financial use case, but then there might be an operational use case. There's likely also a, an environmental and a health and safety use case as well. And it's how you bring all that together to uh, come up with a set of measures that really uh, determine the uh, effectiveness uh, of that uh, approach. Now, <laughs> I think um, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, uh, data being this new energy. Um, so there's this heavy reliance on data. Uh, many in this industry do view their data as proprietary, that it is their competitive advantage. Um, and, but what ends up happening is that when you try to access uh, the data that's good, that is structured, um, it's not readily available, which can sometimes hinder innovation and the progression of existing problems. So how important do you think an open data culture is to the progression of effective data science to solve broader and even more altruistic problems? How do we start changing our mindset around what data should be open or not? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question. And also, I, I want just to tackle this from a perspective, uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, the importance of uh, open data culture. Um, so uh, I think definitely this open data culture, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very important uh, from a perspective, I think from an innovation perspective, so because we all working like in the specifically as the, the, the name indicates of our meetup, this untapped energy, so it's an energy industry. Um, we have some like uh, very common use cases, uh, for example, in the uh, in upstream, in a midstream and in, in downstream and uh, even if for use cases like in logistics, supply chain management. And uh, definitely there could be uh, some uh, data open data culture to be uh, to be actually in uh, among among the uh, enterprises within this industry it can help with the uh, inspiration uh, with innovation uh, let me just uh, use an example so for example if um, um, if I if I see some of the use cases like for example the one that uh, that is pretty famous in uh, in, from Suncor, uh, the one, the autonomous uh, hauling truck system um, in the um, upstream operation mining mining part. Um, actually, um, that part can just give us some like insights about uh, how a specific, how, for example, some uh, machine learning models can be uh, implemented just to uh, during this process. Uh, for other enterprises, for other companies, they may not have like the same uh, kind of use cases. But uh, uh, when dealing, when kind of like scratching out the, the surface of the problem, they they definitely share something in common. Like for example, if we do have some 
um, time series data to deal with. Um, definitely by having this open data culture, we share, um, we know, we, we kind of like on, um, trying, to on the, trying to be on the same page to see how the other company is dealing with um, some data with this kind of pattern. And uh, we got inspired and then we're trying to, to, to innovate. And this sharing and collaboration actually can help uh, also building the, uh, I would like to say technology alignment with each other. Uh, for example, um, I know that um, um, like for example, Sancor uh, leveraging the cloud computing like in Microsoft Azure and uh, TC in the uh, information services, they leveraging uh, AWS and uh, by, by actually sharing, uh, having this open open culture, uh, we we at least align with each other and seeing that, okay, so this kind of uh, technology stack could be, uh, could be uh, referred and could be uh, utilized in our own use cases. Uh, and also by setting up this, uh, let's say the enterprise federation collaboration, some of the common problems could be could be shared for efficiency by knowing that you're dealing with some time series data, uh, you're dealing with some kind of like uh, uh, computer vision uh, problems, how to uh, how to get the better metrics. Uh, from another company perspective, they don't necessarily need to re reinvent the the wells to to kind of like starting from scratch to do the same again, and um, so this culture is actually just to uh, to facilitate each other and just to 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 actually pursuing uh, for better performance better metrics and um, um, yeah that's I think that's from um, a definitely a, a, a pros uh, perspective but from from cons for open data culture it's something uh, very sensitive related to data privacy uh, when we when we're trying to work on that uh, Okay, so let's say uh, Sancor, you have data, and um, but if we want to contribute to this open data culture, there will be a lot of efforts on like doing utilization for the data, and then kind of um, just uh, trying to limit the information to be exposed, and also which going to be like the same same way for all the other enterprises to dealing with the same, and also. Uh, in specifically for each company, the the details of implementation uh, could be could be very different. Um, so I don't think it will be working just to copy directly others. Um, for example, the 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 tuned hyperparameters from a, a machine learning artificial intelligence model from another companies and then directly use that, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So I think from open data culture, um, something like uh, like the forum that we have right now, the meetup and some um, some like federation among companies could be um, helpful to facilitate uh, some of the common uh, problems or in terms of technology, uh, in terms uh, in terms of the uh, the the key challenges that uh, different companies are facing, I think we can definitely align on that part. But in terms of the detailed data privacy, detailed implementation, uh, we can leave the flexibility, the freedom for each company to deal with. 